Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Armorpreneur, managing your cash flow like a pro. We have our poll up for those of you. You will take a minute to answer those questions for us as we get started. And if you would like to have your camera on, you're welcome to. If you don't feel like your camera ready today, that is totally fine. We want to, this is an interactive workshop, so we do have some time for question and answer at the end. Um, but a few other housekeeping things. We are recording today's workshop and you'll get a copy of that after the workshop is over. That way you have it for reference and then we're also recording it for internal purposes. And there is the closed captioning available. If you want to turn the captions off, you can do that. We encourage you to engage through the chat. You can introduce yourself. This is a, a fun way to kind of virtually network. If you have questions for Tom, please feel free to post those in the chat or you can direct message me through the chat as well. And I will save those and share those with Tom. We encourage you to take notes, whether that's online through uh, virtual or through pen and paper, whatever. If there's some things that stand out to you, definitely do that. And after today's workshop, we encourage you to meet with one of our advisors. And at the end, we will also have a quick poll that gives us some good feedback. Those come back to us anonymously. That way we can continue to refine and adjust our virtual workshops to better serve you. We are funded through the United States Small Business Administration, the Virginia SBDC, the George Mason University Mason Enterprise Center, and many local businesses and local economic development organizations, counties, cities, and towns. And our fiscal host and our host for physical space is the Roanoke Regional Chamber of Commerce. So we could not do our work without our fabulous partners to make our workshops available to you and our work available to you here locally. And then across the state of Virginia, we are part of the Virginia SBDC network, which is comprised of 27 different centers, the different color stars. Um, are all over the state of Virginia. So there's an SBDC near you. If you are not in our service area, um, if you want to message me, I'd be glad to get you connected with our colleagues at the respective center that's closest to your business. Um, and we currently serve the Greater Roanoke Valley, the New River Valley, Franklin County, Allegheny Highlands, and the New River Valley. Yes, that is a mouthful. <laughs> we have 19 different localities that we serve out of our center here in the Roanoke and downtown Roanoke and are excited to have you all with us today. And Glad to be here. And we work with businesses in all stages. Our kind of our sweet spot are those businesses that are growing and expanding. And we also work with business owners that have an idea and are ready to start. They work through our Smart Start class as well as folks that are ready to exit their business and they're thinking about selling or somebody who's willing to interested in buying a business. And we help you with all the different technical pieces and parts of managing your business to help you grow and thrive and be a part of the beautiful fabric of our communities across Virginia. Some other quick resources I wanted to share with you if you're not familiar with our website where you went to register, we have a fabulous library. I'll post a link to our chat in the chat for you that has lots of great resources and articles, some worksheets there. If you're not connected with an advisor, I will encourage you to go through our advisor match. I'll also um, post a link to that page there as well as it's listed here on the top of the screen. We just ask a couple of quick intake questions for you and then we'll get you matched with an advisor and you can schedule an appointment for one-on-one -on -one advising for you. All right, the moment y'all have been waiting for is for me to introduce Tom Tanner. Tom is our regional advising director and he's also our vet biz coordinator. Tom is a legend around this region. And across the state, it is my pleasure to introduce him to you. If you have not gotten a chance to meet Tom through one of our workshops or work with him, I encourage you to do so. He is a wealth of knowledge and information. I learned something new from him every moment that I get to spend with him. And I'm excited to that he is going to teach us today and learn about cash flow. Well, I'm going to stop sharing. And Tom, if you will um, transition your slides and we are ready to rock and roll. All righty. Let me get um, <clears throat> the right screen, if this works correctly. Well, Tom's doing that. It looks like we're seeing your... You're seeing the wrong right screen. That's right. Yeah, Should we're seeing... seeing that screen. Are you seeing the correct screen now? Not yet. I think you may... Maybe if you stop share and reshare. Yeah, let me do that then. 
And while you're doing that, I'm going to share the poll I results with some us. screens around. So how about now? There we go. Now we're okay. cooking with gas. All right, T. I was switching some stuff around. All right. Chat screen button. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we have a small audience today, which kind of leads you to understand why this area is less less than being the most exciting field in the world when it comes to business, but very, very important topic to discuss. Are you finished with this, Paul? I can go ahead and knock it out of the way. I am. I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to yep. call out from there. It's in my way, so I'm going to move it so it's out of my space. All right, so what we're going to do is to talk a little about cash flow, understanding cash flow. This is really going to be a basic class because cash flow is a very, very highly complex area that, or can be. And just to give you an idea is that Four or five years ago, I completed a course called Economic Development Finance Professional, which is a certification I, I obtained, um, which was basically about cash flow and understanding cash flow for businesses and et cetera, et cetera. That particular class was 120 hours of in-class work in addition to all the testing involved to say that I'm going to talk about everything I learned in 120 hours is a bit of an understatement. So we're going to be kind of basic because um, I went through all that textbook and everything I did. And I said, well, I got an hour or so to go through this stuff. I think I'm going to try to stay as entry level as possible, but give you enough information to talk about definition, go over some examples, some of the tools that you could use, et cetera. So this is not an advanced class by any means. And the other thing it's not, is not a class that talks about cash flow relates to sales. In other words, I'm not going to say, here's how you can increase your sales, which in turn increases your cash flow. Okay. This is more about figuring out how to manage what's coming in already. All right. So the first thing I'm going to start off with is a little question, which I'm sure all of you have seen these little things from time to time. What is the percent of businesses that fail within the first five, five years? So if you want, type your answer in the chat box. I'm just curious what most of y'all think is the case. What do you think the number of businesses that fail within the first five years are? So let me see what we got so far. Any answers? So I'm also going to ask you at the same time, if you want to answer, is what do you think is the primary reason why these businesses fail? Somebody give me answers here. I got a few. So, all right. In actuality, and the stats are all over the place, but it depends on who you who you find the stats from. But I got these from the SBA, and really within five years, it's forty eight percent. So, um, so it means that fifty two percent are still surviving after five years. But regards to the failure rate, majority of businesses fail because the lack of cash flow which should have tied you into why we're doing this class today. It was kind of a hint there. So, so the next question comes up, can profitable businesses fail? Hmm, can profitable businesses fail? So absolutely, I'm getting a lot of answers. Yes, absolutely, yes. And in actuality, out of those businesses that do fail, 60% 60, 60 of those businesses are profitable. So how do they fail? So we're going to talk about that during the class sometime. All right, so let's do some definitions. So what is cash flow? You hear the term cash flow, what exactly is it? First of all, I want to clarify, 
And I know just for you coming to this class, you already know this answer, but I get this question a lot. Cash, when we talked about the word cash, we don't actually mean the word cash. What we mean is negotiable security, cash, um, checks, credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. I sometimes have clients come in and go, well, I don't really take cash. All I take is credit cards and, and, and checks, but that's all flows under cash, the term cash. So anyway, cash flow. The measurement of how much um, cash a business brings in and spends every period of time. Pretty straightforward, right? Money comes in, money goes out. That's the flow of cash. So the next term we come up, is cash flow the same as profit? What do you think? Is cash flow the same as profit? Nope, nope. Good, good. So what is profit? So profit is basically the difference between the amount earned and the amount spent. So your revenue minus your expenses equals profit. That is a bookkeeping term. It's an accounting term. It's an a tax term. Can you determine your cash flow from a profit and loss statement? You partly can by looking at a profit and loss statement and, and adding back in certain items such as depreciation, amortization, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still not going to give you a true reflection of the true cash flow in a business. It might give you a, a cash flow from operational cash flow, but it's not going to give you the cash flow from the business. So what is the magic formula for cash flow? So you look at it as what's your opening balance of cash flow from the previous month? Or if this is a new month, it's your beginning balance as of the new month. You're adding in the money coming in, subtracting out the money goes out, and then you have a closing cash balance. And then if you subtract that from the opening cash balance, it gives you the cash flow for the period. Pretty straightforward. So what goes into cash flow? So you have inflows and outflows. Green is for inflows, red is for outflows, green is for money, okay? So what do you have? You have customer sales, obviously. You have money coming in because you're selling products, you're selling services, et cetera, et cetera. You also think maybe you have some access, uh, assets sitting around that are not being used and you in turn are selling those. Maybe you are bringing, taking some loans or grants. Maybe you received a grant. Maybe you got a PPP loan or EIDL loan or you got some other grant or you took out a loan at the bank or something and that's bringing money into the business. So that's bringing cash into the business. Capital from the owners. The owners decide to add money into the business. Maybe you have investment uh, you know, the company itself owns rental property, owns investments, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there's a note receivable to, it could be to one of the owners. It could be, um, even though usually the note receivables, the owners usually don't get paid back, but to somebody, it could be an employee note receivable, et cetera. Could be customer's deposits. A customer puts a deposit down on something. That's considered money coming in. Okay. So let's talk about outflows. Obviously, we, we all have wages of some sort, whether it's going to the owner or going to everybody, but we have wages. We have purchases from suppliers that you're buying from, especially if you have inventory and things like that. You have notes or you might have notes and these would be your loans or whatever else, lease payments. Your operating expenses, which again is part of your accounts payable, which is different than the purchases from suppliers. Purchase of assets. You need to go buy some assets of some sort. Um, so you're purchasing assets. You may be using cash for that, or you may be taking a loan out and paying for it. So it may be coming in under inflows and then going back at, out at, at the outflows. Deposits made. Maybe you had to make deposits somewhere else. It could be utility deposits, could be rent, you know, rents on a the uh, rental property that you're uh, lease property and you have to put a deposit down, et cetera. 
It could be you prepaying expenses. Maybe you're paying insurance for the whole year. Maybe you're making loans to uh, loans from others that are coming into it. So it's not just notes. Maybe it's loans from the stockholder or something. And also money to go out would be distribution to owners. So the money coming out and leaving and going to the distribution for owners or draw from employees. I mean, draws from the owners, et cetera. All right. So are all businesses subject to cash flow issues? So some more than others. So ones that are most affected by have accounts receivable and um, have numerous accounts payable. And if you have accounts, you know, in the chat box, I'm just curious, type in there if you have if you have accounts receivables, if you or if you paid everything's somewhat cash. But if you have receivables, type in, I'm just curious how many people run accounts receivables. Um, you have multiple employees, you maintain inventory, you purchase assets on a regular basis. You have a long operating cycle, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And maybe you have seasonal fluctuations. Where on the other side of the equation, businesses that are least affected, it doesn't mean you're unaffected, it just means you're less affected by these other businesses. You operate solely on cash, or maybe you just have part of your business's accounts receivables. You don't have a lot of accounts payable. Maybe you have an employee or don't have any employees. You don't have a lot. Um, and maybe you don't have any inventory. You maintain a small amount of inventory. Or it's not large dollar amounts. You don't necessarily purchase a lot of assets. And you don't have a lot of seasonal fluctuations. A lot of this flows under service businesses, even though service businesses, a lot of service businesses could have employees, could have accounts receivables and things like that. So now we're going to jump into a term which some of you may be familiar with and maybe all of you are familiar with is understanding accrual versus cash uh, cash accounting. So if you're familiar with accrual uh, versus cash accounting, just type yes or no in the, in the box here. So I've got kind of an idea here. Um, accrual bus versus cash accounting. Okay. So the easiest way to account for that is look at it and go, how does money come into your company from a recording standpoint in your books? So let's take a, a landscaper. He goes out and mows grass for a, for his customer. At the end of mowing, he hands the customer a bill for 50 bucks and the customer hands him a check for 50 bucks. That under a cash recounting system, he would re uh, immediately record that as income in the company. If he has an expense that day, so he stops and get gas for his machines and his trucks that morning, and he pays for it right then, then he would record that expense when he paid for it, which was right then. All right, let's take under a cash accounting system the same um, landscaper. He does, he charges an individual 50 bucks. He hands a customer a bill and says, okay, uh, if you would pay this in the next couple of weeks, and the customer says, I'll send you a check in a couple of weeks. Under a cash accounting system, that check would, that sales of that particular mowing would not count until he actually physically receives the money. And the same thing with an expense. It's not counting to you actually pay for the expense. All right. On well, the other side of the equation is accrual accounting. Accrual accounting is basically recording it when you earn it. Back to the landscape guy. He hands the bill to the individual for 50 bucks. They're going to wait a couple of weeks to pay, but he records that income immediately into his records. The same thing. If he records an expense, he buys gas on his credit card. Well, it may not be something he has to pay for right now, but he's going to go ahead and record it because it's an expense as of today. So, <clears throat> A roundabout way to talk about the importance of these two systems is that understanding that when you're trying to figure out your cash accounting system, 
accrual accounting is the way you have to use it in order to really get a feel of how your business is operating from a cash flow perspective. Most of your businesses operate on a tax basis. For tax basis, you operate on a cash accounting system. But to really understand what's going on in your business, you really need to operate under an accrual-based system. And most accounting systems give you that option to operate your books both directions, or they give you the option to run reports either under an accrual system or under, an accounting, uh, under a cash accounting system. All right, got another question for you. Who is familiar with operating cycles or cash conversion cycles? Is anybody familiar with that term? All right, so an operating cycle, which is, again, a very important part of your process. It's the numbers of days it takes a company to convert cash into resources and then convert it back to cash from customer sales. And you'll see how this comes in a point in a minute when we go over some examples. But this is basically what we're looking at. So day one, and number one, you have cash. You've got $5,000 sitting in a bank account. You've got to go buy some materials for your business, okay? Well, you buy materials, and maybe you have them on terms. Maybe it's account receivable. You put it on credit card or whatever. I mean, accounts payable, which you put on credit card. Okay, so that's cash going out. Accounts payable is the final transaction of the cash going out. Okay, and then you have a sales process. And then in a sales process, you might have accounts receivables, which in, in turn turns it back into cash. So this is where all your money goes through this cycle. So let me give you an easier, uh, give you kind of an example so this is Sarah's jewelry store, okay? So Sarah orders supplies on Monday and pays by her debit card, okay? So her when she orders it, the supplies don't arrive until Friday. So there's four days there. All right, so Sarah now takes 10 days to produce all the final product from inventory. So we got a 10-day period there. Now Sarah finally sells all her jewelry the next day, which we'll add another day into. So basically what we're saying is from the time that she buys something and that money leaves her bank account, flies out of her bank account, until the day that money comes back in is 15 days. Okay. So that's an important part of your process, thinking about from the cash flow cycle, is really understanding what your operating cycle is, because there's a lag period that you have to figure out where does that cash come from. For this case here, it's not a big deal, but for as your business grows, it gets more. So let's ask a couple of additional what if questions. What if Sarah pays by a credit card? Does that have any effect on this operating cycle? Yes, no. Yes, because now it's, it's not paid for. There's no cash going out. As a matter of fact, she may have zero operating cycle because she's not going to have to pay for it and probably until after she gets paid by her customer. Okay. So that kind of shows you maybe there's things that you can do to reduce your, your operating cycle to make it um, um, shorter. If, she's, if, uh, if she receives a deposit, the same thing, and maybe that lessens some of that. But if she takes longer to sell her product, then her operating cycle increases even more. Uh, and if she sells on 30-day terms, it's going to add even more to that. So if she was selling on 30-day terms, we'd have to add 30 days to that 15 days or 14 days to determine when that operating cycle is over with. All right, so let's put some money to this just to give you another example. So we start off because Sarah purchases inventory on Monday. She takes a thousand dollars, put on debit card, goes out of her bank account. But she's got 10 days before she can actually sell anything. So she also has two payrolls she's got to deal with before then. So she has $300 payroll on one Friday and $300 on another Friday. So she's already spent $1,600 and she hasn't brought a dime in the door yet. Okay, she does sell her product. 
after 15 days, she earns 400 bucks, but where did her $1,600 come from? Okay, so that's kind of part of this cash flow process to figure out where does it come from? Okay, it may have been from the initial money she put in, et cetera, or it may be a loan that she has, she may have a lot of credit, but those are all part of this understanding your cash flow perspective. So let's take another, let's take John's manufacturing facility. <clears throat> so this particular case, it, there's a 60, uh, 60 day pr production cycle from the time that they order inventory to the time that it's finished production. So, but he does have 30 day terms with his accounts payable people, I mean, with the vendor. So we're going to subtract 30 days from the operating cycle. So now it takes 60 days to produce. After 60 days, it's ready to be sold, but and John sells it on 30 day terms. So now you can see if we add those together and subtract out, he has an operating cycle of 60 days. So again, we put some put some numbers to it. So on February 1st, John orders $10,000 worth of inventory. On 3-1, he pays for it because he had 30-day terms. He has a couple of payrolls in there during that time period. So as a 4-1, his costs incurred are $14,000. And he sells his product on 4-1 with 30-day terms. He gets paid on 5-1 for $20,000 and then makes a profit. Again, it's the same thing is you have to be thinking about where does that extra money come from? And this is all what cash flow is talking about. All right. So just take a second and write these little lines on a piece of paper next to you and think about your business. And we're not talking about the whole business. Just think about it from a cut your, your typical type of situation. What's the date your first expense related to sales happen? And then how fast do you get paid by your customer? And what is that gap? Okay, just think about that. Date you, if you're a landscaper, you know, is it day one and I get paid by my customer day 14 and I've got a 14 day, uh, day gap there. I have to be thinking about what is that? Again, that's kind of what we're talking about your operating cycle. All right. Early in the process, I talked about businesses that fail that are profitable. All right. There's actually a term for that. It's called rapid growth syndrome. And this spreadsheet is probably going to give you a headache, but I'll try to be as painless as possible to go over it. But I want to just try to make a, a couple of points. So, at the bottom there, I've got some scenarios. It's $5,000 in inventory is purchased on January 1st. Inventory cycle is 60 days, which means it takes 60 days from the time I order to the time it's finished to be able to sell it. The accounts payable is 30 days, so I don't have to pay for 30 days after I buy inventory. And once I finish a product, I sell it, the accounts receivables is now 60 days. So it's two months before I get paid. We have sales increasing each month and the business is operating at 10% net profit margin. Probably more information you need to know, but let me try to explain this. So, whoops, it didn't even want to stay there. Okay, so in January, we have 5,000. Are you able to see my cursor? I never knew if you could or not. Can you see my cursor? Or do I need to use a pen? No, I don't see no, we'll your catch cursor, it. Tom. Okay, let me use a pen. I never can remember where. So, can you there see? There we it? go. Okay. Yes. So, we got this $5,000 here. This is my initial purchase of, of inventory, okay? There's nothing going on the rest of this month. But now in February, we have cash out of $5,000. We have no cash coming in yet because nothing's been sold. Okay. So we actually have a minus $5,000 worth of net cash that month. But we're also purchasing $6,000 more of inventory because we, we're, we're doing more production. We're keeping the production flying out the shelves. So we're constantly buying inventory every month. 
but our net ending cash flow is $5,000, okay? So that ending cash balance is going to go up here as the beginning cash balance. Where 60 days is over, I finally can make my sale for $5,555, which is 10% net profit, okay? We also have to buy more inventory. We also have to pay for this inventory in February. So I actually have a net cash out of 6,000. And if I add that to minus 5,000, we're down to minus 11,000, okay? So I'm not gonna go through each month, but you can see the process and you can look at these slides when we send them back out. But for this particular business, they're growing well, they're doing good. But if you look at the end of the year, they've gone from a zero cash balance to a minus $206,000 because of their growth scenario. Okay. So this is the perfect example of why profitable businesses go under. This business is profitable, but they didn't have the cash to sustain them. And you have to figure out, what am I going to do? In this case here, this business needed to have you know, two or three hundred thousand dollars working capital loan or a working line of credit or something to keep them going, or they would never make it past the first year. All right. So let's talk about what can you do to help you get a better handle on your cash flow. So one of the first things you can do is make sure your accounting system is set up correctly. And you can do cash flow analysis on a sheet of paper and cash flow analysis on a um, um, Excel spreadsheet or whatever else. But certainly a computerized accounting system is going to give you much better information than just paper and pencil. So try to set up a computerized accounting system. It's going to be much better for you. Make sure you set up your chart of accounts correctly. And I see this way too often with clients is that they'll have multiple income streams and multiple cost of goods streams. And they'll have one sales account and one cost of goods account. And what you should do when you're setting up your charts of account, if, especially if you're selling products, and this applies more to selling products, even though it could apply to services that may be treated differently. But if you're selling products, is figuring out what are those top primary income accounts that you're dealing with. Let's, you know, if it's a landscaper, it may be, you know, mowing grass, it may be fertilizing, it may be mulching, it may be something like that. Those are all going to be set up because they may have different. Um, you want, for one, is you want to keep track of where your income is coming from. It's not really cash flow related, but it's, keeping track of your income. But then you set up your COGS account, your cost of goods account, and you want to match your income system, your income accounts to your cost of goods account so that you can properly monitor your cost of goods for each one of those income accounts. So if you were selling mulch and you want to keep track of your mulch cost of goods, is making sure those particular expenses reflect back to the income account so that if you have business, if you have income streams that all have different cost of goods percentages, you know, one particular income stream may have a 10% cost of goods. Another one may have a 50%. Well, if everything is dumped into one, there's no way for you to keep an eye on what's going in on your business and where you're having problems at. When you match them appropriately, you can. All right. Hopefully that's not more confusing than it sounded to me just now. But enter your bills when you get them. This is also important because if you just stick the bills in your drawer and then when you get around, just pay them all at one time, then you're not properly managing your cash. And you don't know you're not properly managing cash because you can't pull it, easily pull a report up and see where you're at. Now, if you've got a couple of bills, that's a different situation than if you've got 30 bills sitting there. You need to have some sort of system where you can enter your bills so that you can schedule out your, you know, when they're due. You can schedule the, you know, if you're going to take discounts, et cetera, et cetera. 
if you're using things like QuickBooks Online, they charge you an upgrade fee to be able to, to use the bill the bills function. Um, but if you have a lot of bills, then I would certainly recommend it so that you can better manage where your bills are coming from and you can use some tools better on trying to manage your software. I mean, manage your cash flow using software. Making sure you enter invoices as soon as the jobs are complete. It's amazing. I talk to clients and they go, well, I, I made a chance to build this out. I usually do it at the end of the month. Okay, that's not the way you do it. As soon as the job's finished, bill it out. Because as soon as you bill out, the money comes in. Same thing with entering payments. You know, this is another case where clients sometimes will go to the bank every two weeks and they'll have, you know, 50 checks sitting in their bank in, in their top desk drawer before they go to the bank. You want to get the money into the, the bank as soon as possible. One is less chance of losing the check. Um, but even more importantly, again, has to do with cash flow. Uh, well, we already talked about accrual versus cash. Is making sure you're running your reports on an accrual-based system, um, and also tracking your lot your your current liabilities. And this has to do with more with helping you determine some ratios. Is and the biggest thing is usually your note payments. If you have note payments, you you may or may not know you're supposed to break out your 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 next twelve months worth of payments to own banknotes to current liabilities and leave the rest of it in long-term liabilities. In effects, when you're trying to do some um, KPI ratios. And is correct information being entered in the right place to begin with? And does anybody know what GIGO means? So this is a famous term in accounting. Well, it's probably not anywhere, but accounting is a fairly well-known term. Does anybody want to guess what it means? Good go. Martha got it right. Garbage in, garbage out. Okay. So making sure that stuff is entered in the right place. All right. Financial review. Are you reviewing your P&Ls as soon as possible to end the month? Okay. Um, I have some clients that go, well, you know, I usually review them at the end of the quarter. And usually at the end of the quarter, my accountant gets it to me by the following month after the end of the quarter or whatever else. No, you should review your P&L no later than a week after the end of the month for the previous month. It used to be excuse wise. Well, I got to wait for my bank statements to get in. And once my bank statements get in, I got to do the reconciliations and all that. Well, nowadays, your bank statements are available at the bank online, usually at 12.01 the next day. So um, you want to try to do your bank reconciliation, print off your profit and loss statement, and evaluate your profit and loss statements to see what's going on in your business. Because a lot of what cash flow is, is, is not just monitored in cash, but I mean, monitored in cash where it's going, is it going in the wrong place? Is it, is it somehow missing? Is it disappearing? Or is your margins going down? And then it's a matter of figuring out why are my margins going down? That's why it's important to match your cost of goods count to your income, income account. Because if you notice that your margin on certain products are 50%, and all of a sudden on your P&L, you start seeing 30%, you have to be asking yourself, something's going on here. I don't know what it is, but I need to figure it out. I need to be a detective. Are you balance your cash batch regularly? Uh, are you evaluating your cash balance regularly? And this is important to look at it on a, maybe not a daily basis, but in some cases a daily basis, just to see what's coming in, what's going out. And of course, there's tools that you can use to do that, um, some better than others, but it could be just as simple as looking at your bank balance every day and, and putting in, if you're using QuickBooks Online, let's just say, a lot of people who use QuickBooks or QuickBooks Online, they wait till the bank drops down their um, expenses or their checks or whatever before they record them, but it, it's not giving you the true balance of what should be in your in your bank account. So entering your transactions ahead of time, your checks, your expenses, so that you're not surprised at, at how much is coming out of your bank account. All right, the number one, if you have A&Rs, 
Are you looking at your aging report? And again, it's amazing. Sometimes I sit down with clients and I'll notice there's this gigantic amount sitting in the 120 dollar or 90 day column or 120 column or whatever it might be, however the business is set up, but it's sitting in their 90 day column and their terms are 30 days. And it's so a question is why is there all this money in the 90 day column? And it's, you know, well, I just really hadn't had a chance to get back with them or they're just slow payers or what it might be. So Keeping a top on your AR is one of the biggest things that can help. And do you have options? Are you looking at options to make it easier for clients to pay? Are you offering credit cards? Are you doing ACHs? And just because you offer credit card doesn't mean you can't charge. I have multiple clients that charge a fee for using their credit card. Uh, some people don't want to use credit cards because they, they lose 3% or 275 or 2 and a half, whatever it is, you're losing it. So maybe you add it as a fee. Or maybe you really ask for ACH information, which is usually a much cheaper process to go through than a credit card process. Should you offer discounts? In other words, should you offer, a, if you offer 30-day terms, should you offer a 2% 10 or something where you give a 2% discount if they pay within 10 days? Some of your vendors may do that. Or should you change your terms? Again, another conversation I have with clients is, you know, a landscaper. I have landscapers that, you know, they give 30-day terms. And my question is, why do you give them 30-day terms? You, I mean, you produce the work today. Why, why are you letting them wait 30 days to pay you? You've got all these expenses that you incurred, labor, gas, and insurance, all this stuff before you get paid. Um, look at your terms. Does it make sense to change your terms? I'm not saying it does, but that's just something you should look at. Are you looking at your accounts payable journal? Or are you looking at your expenses, what I'm basically saying? Or are you looking down at your expenses to see where your money is actually going? You know, are you looking at your bank statements? And this is something I always suggest, especially if you have a bookkeeper or account or somebody else who does your bank recs and things like that, is... And this is more of an audit than it is a cash flow. Of course, somebody's stealing from you, it's cash flow too. But is from an audit reason, you should be making sure that you're the ones that opens the bank statements, if in fact they're actually mailing to you. Or you should be reviewing the bank statements online each month to look through there and see where's your money going. Just looking through the checks that are cleared and see if things just jump out at you, okay? There's two things that may be there. One is that you didn't realize you were paying these people this much money. You may realize that you seem to be writing a check to somebody that you didn't sign and you don't know who it is. Um, so anyway, it gives you a chance to kind of figure out where your money's going. And of course, we always talk about company expenses. And if you're in a business that should be doing some sort of job costing, such as you're in a construction industry, where you're doing jobs, you should run some sort of report to see per job where your money is going to in each job and whether each job is profitable. And of course, accounting errors uh, could be a major thing. And I, again, I see this information where people are, they're not reconciling their bank statements, not doing stuff. And what happened is they end up overstating their income, which means they end up paying more in taxes uh, which in turn affects your cash flow. So processes and procedures. So if you have credit cards within your organization, who's authorized to purchase stuff through them? And if, is there any kind of control going on there? Is there, especially, um, is there a procedure to make sure that things are processed or approved or whatever? Who monitors your inventory purchases? Is there some system in place to do that? I, you know, if you if you're not careful, because you get if you have somebody else doing purchasing, they're just going to say, well, we need all this stuff, and we'll just order. We're going to use it sooner or later, and they just order a bunch of stuff, and you end up having way too much inventory, and you're tying up your cash in in, in into inventory. 
do you have anything system in place to monitor payroll or please clock it in early, which you'd be surprised how much that can cost you by if you have employees, every employee clocking in five or 10 minutes early, then sooner or later, that can be a tremendous amount of money. If you're slow or you have a process to send people home, again, all these things help you control your cash going out. Are there procedures to committing to subscription-based products such as software subscriptions, you know, magazines, books, dues, or whatever it may be? It's amazing, <clears throat> even me personally, sometimes I review my personal credit card and I go, dang, why am I still paying this? I haven't done, I haven't used this service in two years. And you'd be surprised at the number of things that may be in reoccurring on your credit card that you forgot that you even committed to, that you thought to, well, I just committed to a month and now I was going to cancel and dang, I forgot to cancel two years ago. Okay. So look at those kind of things. Do you look at vendors to see if there's better options or better pricing? Do you ask for better pricing from your vendors? Do you ask for better terms? If, if they say, well, I can't really give you any more uh, uh, better pricing, but Maybe I can give you better terms, and that can help you from a cash flow perspective. All right, so let's talk about loans and other uses of cash. At some time, does it make sense to refinance a loan? Is it longer term, lower interest rates, et cetera, et cetera? Of course, right now we've got completely the opposite. But you know, right now, if you're if you have to take a loan out now and you're paying seven or eight percent interest, you know, twelve to fifteen months from now you might go, does it make sense to me to go back to the bank and say, is it time to refinance? Because rates by then may be at five and a half or 6%. So you need to always be looking at, is there ability to re re refinance at a lower interest rate? And be careful to match loans. So it, loan matching is, is an extremely important thing that a lot of people don't think about when they do this. So loan matching is basically saying, what am I buying with this loan and what should the term be? What happens sometimes, let's say a company is going to be buying this big piece of equipment, so a $100,000 piece of equipment, and it has a useful life of 15 years. So you go to the bank and say, I need a, you know, I got this equipment I'm buying. It's going to last 15 years. I just need a 10-year note on it. And the bank goes, yeah, sure, it'll work out fine. And at the same time, they go, I think I want to go ahead and throw in, I need to get some new laptop computers. So I'm going to spend another $10,000 on laptops. And I'm just going to go ahead and throw those in there at the time. Well, basically what you're doing is you're, you're financing a laptop for 10 years, which might have a useful life of three years. So it's important to always look at your loans to make sure you're matching them correctly to whatever you're buying. Because if not, you're you're buying something that you're you're extending the life of your loan for something that's not even going to exist in a few years. So what else are you going to do? What are you going to plug this gap? We, you know, we, we talked about this gap. So what are you going to do to plug this gap? Are you going to set up a line of credit with the bank? Are you going to take out a home equity line um, to use that? When I was in business, I I took out lines of credit to business, but I also had a line of credit on my home that I used in my business all the time because um, that was, at the time, it was easy money to get. Am I going to rely on a working capital loan where I'm just going to get a big source of money and just use it as a working capital loan because I know money's going to come in, it's going to go out, it's going to come in and go out, and I'm going to use that rather than a line of credit because working capital loans typically might be cheaper in the long run. Am I going to allow owners to basically say, well, we're going to float any kind of needs for income that we need? Am I going to look at AR financing, which is accounts receivable financing, where there's companies out there will buy your accounts receivables from you and pay you a, a certain percentage for them? Or do I just need a short term working capital? Or maybe it's just I need a short loan for the next six months because we're going through a, a slow time of, of in the period. Do you have a process before you buy 
a, an asset? Do you look at, okay, what is the return on investment for that? And the biggest thing to look at, you look at a piece of equipment, let's just say it's a landscaper again. Um, I, I need to buy this $12,000 lawnmower and we can easily, there is a good return on investment. We've already noted, noted, we have this amount of work we need to get done, we can't get done. So now you have to look at it as, do I pay with cash or do I finance? Obviously you pay with cash, you're saving finance fees, but you're also losing that availability of your cash to have access to it. So you really have to evaluate your business structure and look at, do I just have such an abundant excess of cash that I don't need that, that I should be using my cash? Or should I finance it instead and still have cash in my hand? To me, people jump out and just buy stuff with cash and then they run out and then they go, oh man, I don't have any money in my bank account. What am I going to do? Rather than financing it, because you can always pay off loans. And also beware of these fast, fast cash loan places. I know you hear them on TV all the time and radio and everybody else, you know, get your money tomorrow. You know, it's simple. If you need, $50,000 to $200,000, we can have your cash in your bank account in two days or whatever, okay? I can just tell you those particular loan programs, unless you desperately need money because of filling a really short-term gap for a very high margin business, um, job, you got to be careful. of. I, I, I've evaluated a bunch of those and typically the interest rates on those things, if you look at them, on an annual rate or anywhere between 20 and 40%. So you've got to look very, very close at that. The same thing with leases. You got to be careful with leases that they can also be very, very high. If you have inventory, do you do a physical inventory? How often do you do a physical inventory? Is there a way to determine what your shrinkage is? And shrinkage basically means is I got inventory. I'm selling inventory and there's things missing. Okay, that's shrinkage. Shrinkage means that somehow it's walking out the door without somebody paying for it. Okay, um, you need to make sure you got something in place because that's cash walking out the door. That's those little green guys walking out the back door. Um, and do you have old inventory? Again, this is another thing. If you got old inventory, don't keep it around. Uh, I get clients again that come in and go, I said, what's all this, what's all this high dollar volume with the inventory? Well, so I'm gonna have to sell it below cost. Well, I said, that's fine, but if it's not gonna do any good sitting on the shelf and it's gonna be worth, is it gonna be worth more, you know, two years from now than it is now? It's probably gonna be worth less. So turn it over into in into income, into cash. And if you have assets sitting around sitting around, you should be doing the same thing. All right, so metrics. Think about metrics that also make sense for your particular business that you want to keep track of. And this helps you also, not specific, in some cases, specifically look at cash, but it helps you understand what's going on in your business, which in turn, if you understand what's going on in your business, the cash will also follow suit. And this could be something as simple as looking at sales or profit per employee. Is that number going up or down on a, on a monthly basis or per square foot, which some retailers are use? You look at your break-even analysis, inventory turns. If you have inventory, that's a big one. Looking at your inventory, do you have, and you have to look at your industry or your particular case to see what your inventory turns are. But inventory turn basically means is how often am I turning my inventory? Do I have, am I turning it like, I buy it one day and 30 days later, I got to buy it again because I'm selling it all in one month. Or I, I see business every once in a while, they'll have, you know, $100,000 in inventory and their, and their annual sales is $100,000, um, which means they've got like one turn a year, which is not good. Okay. So look at your business and you have to look at it. In some cases, you, you, your inventory turns may be longer in your particular industry than others, but you need to evaluate what it is and and use that as a KPI. So at least you're monitoring. If you're if you're typically three to one, make sure 
that you're actually doing that and not shrinking out. It's going to four, it's going to five, it's going to six, et cetera. Days of collection on accounts receivables, days to pay A and P, maybe you're paying too quick and you're using up your cash because you're not, um, you're, you're paying faster than you really need to be, which means you're using up your cash. You can also look at what's called a quick ratio, which is just dividing your current assets by your current liabilities. And that should be one or greater so that if it's less than that, you're in trouble. Uh, and also look at your particular industry to see which one is best for your particular industry. All right. So the other thing you have to look at is what's the effect of, uh, of price increases on your bottom line? So this is another thing I talk clients about is understanding that we're all looking right now at prices of products going up, uh, of the raw raw goods that are going up, okay? And some clients will go, well, I really don't want to go up. I'm trying to control my, re my retail price because I don't want to charge too much to my customers. So let's just look at it from a financial perspective. So... In this case, on the top line, you're basically saying is that I'm selling a product at $1 that costs me 50 cents, which gives me a 50% profit margin, okay? So my new product cost, that 50 cents, just went up to 60 cents for the exact same product, okay? If I need to, to increase my price to match that new sales price at a 50% margin, I now have to charge a dollar 20 for it. Okay. So you have to be looking at your pricing and go, well, my cost of goods are going up and I need to maintain my margin. I need to raise my price by this much in order to make up for that. What happens if I say, well, I'm just going to eat the difference. Then what happens is in this last column, it says a decrease in profit without changing sales price basically means that you're losing 10% of your profit margin by not raising your prices. So just remember this is keep look at this stuff and always keep track of what's going on from a cost standpoint and raise your prices appropriately. I know none of us always like to raise prices, but you, you sometimes have to in order to keep your business float, uh, the cash flow floating correctly. All right, so let me just show you kind of a really simple cash flow sheet that you can use. And we're, I'm going to show you a, a spreadsheet that I'm going to send out to you that you're welcome to use. And then we're going to cover a couple of other options that you have. So for this particular one, we, if you notice on the left-hand side, it says started with $1,000. Started with $1,000 in my bank account. I have $1,000 each month. My expenses are $500. My accounts receivables is um, 30 day terms and my loan payments, $500. And, and I also purchase an asset on month one. So beginning balance is $1,000. <clears> cash sales. So I have cash sales at $1,000. All right. The first month I didn't collect any accounts receivables because we, we have 30 day terms. So now I've got a cash balance of $1,500. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Also, I had a loan payment of 500 bucks. I had to buy some a, a computer or something for 500 bucks. And my ending cash balance is $500. Okay. Straightforward. This is a really, really simple example. And now I have a beginning balance of 500. And now I'm just kind of going through the same thing. Cash sales of 1,000. My AR now collected. I sold in the previous month for 600. I have additional accounts payable, and now my cash balance is 16. Still have a loan payment, but my ending count, cash balance is now 1100. So this is just a really simple flow through example. Now, the, the chart that I have here, uh, this is one I'm going to send you. And let me just kind of go to it. I can figure out where it is. So you should be looking at my cash flow forecast. Again, you can have this. You can put it in a starting cash on hand. You can put 10,000, you can put the start of date, et cetera, et cetera. And you're basically, these are projections. These are forecasts that you can put in and kind of figure out, okay, what are my 
cash needs over the next 12 months. Okay, if you really want to get into cash flow forecasting, this is what you can do. You can put in, you know, put in each line out of here under contribution, collections. You're going to put in what you, you think your costs are going to be during the month. Now, uh, <clears throat> under COGS here, you'll notice there's there's a formula, here, and I'm sure why, because cost of goods, <clears throat> the way you technically are supposed to do it and the way most people do it in a small business is two different things. So the way COGS are figured is that your cost of goods are based on the amount of money attributed to the sales that were generated that particular month. Okay, a lot of times it's basically a lot of small businesses basically say this is how much inventory I bought this particular month. And maybe at the end of the year, they balance it out. Okay, on the last at the last month of the year, which is not the correct way to do that. Mm -hmm. You also, if you have an interest expense, interest expense um, goes on a profit and loss statement, but on a cash flow statement, I usually take it out uh, because down here I have a loan payment in a loan payment, that way I don't have to break out principal and interest because I know what my loan payment is. I may not know what my interest and penalty principal is. I also have inventory purchases. And down here, I'm basically saying, okay, I'm having a beginning inventory. I'm, I'm buying inventory. I'm doing an inventory at the end of the month. And that gives me my cogs in the month. And I realize, realize this is a really complicated process trying to do an inventory every month or you may just have to do a, a spot inventory or something but that is the proper way to figure out because because inventory is using cash and it may be a lot more than what your cost of goods is projected to be so somehow you've got to project your cost of goods um and you have to project what your inventory purchases are going to be so if you're a retail business you may be purchasing your goods in October that you're not selling to December. Well, your cash is coming out of your account in October, not in December when your actual COGS are, are taking advantage of. Anyway, this is one I will send to all of you so that you can see it in detail. Now, what other options do you have? So if you're using QuickBooks Online, there is a cash flow planner built into it. Not the best thing in the world, but it works. Uh, if you were using a, the, the online version, that's the, not the simple start version, but the up from that, it allows you to enter your bills. If you're entering bills, then this is going to help you project your cash out. If you have accounts receivable, it's going to use a system to try to project what your cash needs are going out into the future. Okay. It's not the best system, but it definitely will work. QuickBooks also has a budgeting um, system built in, but unfortunately you have to have like the third layer up in their subscription models to take advantage of their budgeting. Their budgeting works very well where you can come up and create an entire budget for all of a particular year. You can import data from the previous year to use as a guideline. It's, I mean, so it's a pretty slick function. And then once you create this budget, it will now let you do a run budget versus actual that you can run each month and actually be able to get, you know, understand what your actual was, what your budget was, what your over budget was, et cetera. So that's a cool feature. Now, if you don't have the higher version and you just want to, you have the quick start version or you have a desktop version or something else, you can export your data into a spreadsheet and basically you export in your profit and loss statement. Maybe you do it by month and then you basically put it into an Excel spreadsheet where you are listing all your, your information. You're putting in your, your actuals manually on a month to month basis, or you're cutting and pasting it each month in there and you're kind of monitoring your cash flow that way. Certainly can be done. Do a lot of people do it? Probably not because it's pretty time consuming to do that. So is there other options? Sure. So there's multiple software options out there. And I'm just going to give you 
some of the ones that I have looked at and evaluated. And the ones I'm look that I'm going to give you here are reasonably priced. Um, and reasonably priced means I think they're under 50 bucks a month. So um, there are some of them out there that are $300 a month. So I stayed away from those because I figured most of you would not pay that. But there are some for like $19 a month, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're in a situation where you're really trying to monitor your cash flow, using these tools can be very, very um, useful. So this is just one, is SIF Financial. There's another one called Budgio. All of these will actually bring in your data from QuickBooks or will actually sync with QuickBooks uh, and other accounting systems to give you the most current data and give you the best budgeting process, planning process possible. It doesn't change your information in QuickBooks. All it does is provide you this data so that you can create dashboards so that you can evaluate your business more distinctly. Cash flow frog is one I've looked at and I kind of actually like. So I'm experimenting with all of these because um, we're going to be using some of them here. And another one is take the helm dot uh, take the helm is another one. So these are all tools that you can use within your business to help you manage your cash flow. So that is the coverage of the basic cash flow system. I'm sure that you probably have millions of questions. There is something else I want to just present to you. This is a service that I'm working on now. I have not finalized it, but what we're doing is putting together a program for businesses where, where I would um, quarterly review your financials, run them through particular um, scenarios, run them through, bench, uh, through some desk dashboards, um, look at KPIs and then meet with the client to kind of go over the findings uh, of what I found and talk about, you know, ways that you can improve things, et cetera, et cetera. So when we launch this program, there's going to be a limited number of slides. In other words, I'm not going to do this for every treating client because it's going to be quite time consuming. And there's going to be an application process. And most likely it's going to be individuals who are tied into QuickBooks Online, because that's going to be the easiest way to tie in um, being able to perform these particular functions. It doesn't mean if you're on desktop or another program like Peachtree or you're on something else, we can't do it. It's just going to be easier for me to do it from QuickBooks Online. So that is my simplified version of cash flow online or cash flow management. Um, I'm sure there's probably numerous questions, or if I just kind of like everybody has blank faces or or what. So Heather, I'm gonna let you open it up. Uh, I guess you're gonna stop recording, but open it up for questions and stuff. And I'll try to do my best.